What up, y'all? It's another uh, Live with Lee Wars with your boy here, Brian Lee Wars, the word of the week to help encourage your hearts and edify your souls. Uh, you know, we had a little bit of a, a technical difficulty before. I wanted to start this thing up properly, so we're just going to launch it again. So welcome one and all if you're just joining us. Great to have you here. I'm going to just get right to the point and connect with my uh, special guest of the hour, Mr. Mishak Lufiel, I believe. So uh, just hang tight and we'll get started. As you're coming through, please do drop the thumbs, hearts, whatever, comments, let me know that you're here. So I always encourage you to know who's with us here at Live Land and until you indicate that somehow we don't really know. Uh, but yeah, it's so grateful to have you guys joining us. And I believe the Lord has a good word for us tonight uh, that we could receive from him. A practical word and how we uh, how we're to, how we could actually represent him well in whatever world that we're living in. All right, so give me a second and I will connect to my guest. Welcome, Bishop. We're going to see you there. Okay, good. I see you there, bro. Praise God. Let's get the show on the road. Uh, please resend that request, Mishak. See if something happened there. Just uh, please resend it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How are you? Here we go. Good, man. How you doing? I'm good. So this must be a good one tonight because the devil's already active. <laughs> so exactly. To share with the people. As, as expected. As expected. But he's also defeated, as we already know as well. As expected. Amen. Amen. So God be the glory. All right, man. So I'll just dive uh, right into it. Um, yes. So this is my brother here, Mishak Lufiel. I said that right, right? That's, yep, that's you right. did. Yep. Mm hmm yeah, which, uh, which is a pretty good brother of mine. We've actually been connected more recently uh, through a church that we both frequent here in the GTA called The Torch, uh, mm -hmm. Pastor Kevin Morera. And it's funny because uh, I was just thinking about it today. I mean, uh, when I first met, so it's actually him and his brother, Abednego, that have become fairly good friends of mine in the last little while. But it's, it's, inter it's interesting because my first introduction to you guys was a bit of a mistaken identity. Because mm -hmm. I, when, I remember, when I first met you guys, I thought it was your brother, Shadrach. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that I was coming across, if you remember, right? And Shadrach yeah. is actually the first member of their family who I officially knew of. He had mm -hmm. uh, randomly started coming on some of my posts here and there, commenting. And it's funny, when I when I saw you guys, I got the Lufio vibe, but I was just in the wrong direction because it wasn't actually him, it was you guys, you know? But there's, there's actually a, a very interesting story with that, with you and your brothers. Can you share a bit about that, about, the, about that pro uh, prophetic connection that exists? Yeah, so basically, uh, when my mom and dad were young, before they had any kids, um, my dad said that the Lord spoke to him and said that God was going to give him three boys. Now, I don't have any children, but for people that have kids, it's very hard to dictate that you're going to have three boys or three girls. or You know what I mean? It's very hard to tell, obviously. Um, yeah. So when my dad had told people that, people were just like, oh, you're crazy, you're this, you're that. Um and a lot of people were actually saying that they would give their life to Christ if this, if this happened. Um, really? Then, boom, uh, Shadrach 
myself, Meshach, Abeno came, but it was a lot of opposition. Um, my brother, um, when I came out, actually, I had to stay in the hospital for a couple of weeks. I couldn't breathe okay. on my own. Um, when I came wow. out, the, the umbilical cord is actually wrapped around my neck, so I was very uh, sick. So there's a lot of opposition from the enemy, but the reason why God wanted, and God said, I want you to name him Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The reason why, if you guys know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego, who yep. the three brothers that stood up against the king uh, Nebuchadnezzar, um, basically mm -hmm. God wanted to tell my dad that whenever you go through fire, I will be there with you. Because as we know in the story, uh, there, was a, there was a fourth person inside of the fire, right? And it was Jesus. So Yes, the fourth man in the fire. Mm -hmm. The fourth man in the fire, yes. Mm -hmm. Was Jesus. So that's where yeah. my parent, my dad got that from, and we've been living it out ever since. So, uh, praise God, praise God. As he, just, as he pointed out, you see that those, those two names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, very significant names in the scripture. Uh, you know, the Hebrew boys that were well known for their courage and their bravery as standing up against an ungodly king in mm -hmm. a time that was hard to be a believer. Mm -hmm. You know, very much like we're living in now in a lot of ways. So, um, mm -hmm. very interesting prophetic connection, even to the times that we're living in at the moment. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's, that's cool. And also, you guys have a pretty unique um, accomplishment, even professionally, in terms of what you guys do. Because if you guys know mm -hmm. the timeline, uh, you know, the tagline here was Athletes for Christ. And as you might figure, you know, you, you can't see me, Sean, but he's a very tall guy. He happens to be a basketball player. Uh, so are his brothers. And they also have a very unique accomplishment where that's concerned as well. Can you share a bit about that? Yeah, so uh, it's funny because the three brothers, you know, they walk together. We were actually one of the first three brothers to ever play on one professional basketball team, which was uh, for the Guelph Nighthawks. Um, I never in a million years dreamed um, that I'd be playing on the same uh, professional team as any of my brothers for that sake. But to be on the team with all three of them was kind of surreal, um, kind of amazing. And, and the season before that, I actually had uh, Shadrach um in halifax so it was just something we didn't want to take for granted something that was just like amazing for both of us and having that name having those names and being able to play together on the court was just was just unbelievable yes and how does, how does it feel like I mean, a lot of people can say that they actually play professionally with their siblings like like what is that feeling like does it ever feel like awkward does it feel weird like how's it actually feel um for me personally, like, especially having my bigger brother there, you feel a little bit more, I guess, like, protected. Your big brother's there with you. Um, I just felt more, like, whether we lose, win, whether I play a lot or don't play a lot, it didn't matter because I was with my brothers. And not only that, we all we all actually all lived in the same house. So it was, uh, it was a lot going on with that team, a lot of ups and downs. But having my brothers beside me, you know, rather in, in other seasons, being by myself or being with teammates I don't really connect with. Um, having my brothers was, was just an amazing blessing. And my parents were able to come up a couple of times and visit us and see us. And we cooked for them and took them out and stuff. So it was a great experience. Um, something that I don't know would ever happen again, but something that's always that's written in the history books for us, for sure. Mm. And when that happened, were you, was it actually here in Toronto or was it like a, where in the world were you guys? When you were playing together? Uh, we were here in Guelph. Guelph. The team was called the Guelph Nighthawks um, okay. with the CBL, the Canadian uh, Elite Basketball League. So uh, we were actually there for the inaugural season, their first time opening up, which was last year. So um, we were all there at the same time. And uh, coached by the, the coach, Terry Offshaw, had drafted and picked us all up and put us on the team. So um, shout out to him for, for making that happen. Yes. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. So I'm going to actually move along to like some of the official questions that I had drafted here for Mishak. Uh, however, as we're going along for all those who are viewing, if for any reason you can't hear myself or uh, Mishak properly, do drop a comment and let us know so we can at least uh, troubleshoot that as we're going along because we want to make sure you're able to hear all that's being said here. I mean, that's, that's part of the point in terms mm -hmm. of this talk. So uh, yeah, please do uh, drop any comments. Let us know if anything's not coming through clearly. Also, if you have any questions as we go along, um, do drop them in the comments as well. And if we have time at the end, uh, we'll definitely try to get to them. And serious questions as well. Not, you know, what's Mishak's favorite color? Maybe it'll be cool to talk about that. But, like, more so, like, just actual, like, things that maybe speak what we're talking about. And that might be useful uh, for a larger audience to know. So if you have those questions, do uh, drop them in the comments as we go along also. All right? Um, so, yes. So first things first. Um, now, I've heard you talk about how often... 
you know, our plans for us are not the same as God's plans for us, right? And that makes me think of the whole scripture that many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord who directs his steps, right? Mm -hmm. So like, you touched on that in one of your talks. You also talked about how you never really saw yourself ever being so openly proclaiming your faith. Uh, that was something, a comment that you made. So uh, I guess that just to start us off, why is it that you uh, that you said stuff like that, and what makes it so different for you now? Uh, you know, I look at the story of Moses, and if you know anything about the story of Moses, Moses was raised as an Egyptian. Um, he was the prince of Egypt, was in charge with stone building and a lot of different things. Um, yeah. You know, as you know, the story of Moses as a baby he was given away. Because at the time, you know, a lot of stuff was happening with the Israelites and his mother, his actual mother wanted to save him, you know, so she had, so she, she had given him away. Um, and that story is very interesting. And I, I relate to that story a lot um, because Moses didn't want to be um, the prince. You know, he didn't want to be the prince, but it's something that was given to him, something that he took with him. Right. And then we know the story of Moses when they found out his identity. He was actually kicked out of um, Egypt and was sent into exile by the, the new Egyptian prince, Pharaoh's son, right? Um, real son. And Moses became someone who basically allowed the plagues of God to hit um, Egypt and, you know, the famous let my people go and the split of the Red Sea. And if you really think about it, Moses wasn't, this wasn't something that Moses wanted to do but it was something that God instructed Moses to do. And when I say sometimes our plans are not God's plans, right? It's important to understand that whenever we want to do something, we got to be walking and aligning ourselves with the will of God, right? A lot of times as Christians, we're praying to God for things, but we're not asking God if this is within his will, right? Everyone was made for a purpose. The Bible says that many are called, but few are chosen, right? And the reason why the Bible says that is because God is calling everyone. God is calling everyone, but only a few answer that call. Only a few are chosen, right? Yeah. And you, when we talk about the fivefold ministry, you know, there's different parts of that ministry that all work together, right? So with my life, just, you know, being a professional basketball player and, and it became my identity. It was something that I love to do. I, I love to play. I love hearing the crowd scream my name, you know, different things like that. Um, I was, a, I was, I, yeah, I was a professing, Christ, uh, profess, professing Christian, but... I never lived that life, you know. Uh, I was definitely living a double life, uh, alcoholism and other things that was holding me back. Um, and I just kept telling myself, like, man, like, you know, the Bible says don't trample on the grace. And that's what I was doing. I was 100% trampling the grace and knowing that my dad was a pastor and I could go and ask forgiveness and different things like that. But I always tell people this. When we sin, sin has a consequence. Yep. Look at the story of the, the murder on the cross with Jesus. Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. But it doesn't mean just because he gave his life that hour and Jesus took him to heaven, it didn't mean that Jesus took him off the cross. No, he still had to live out his consequences as a murderer. He still had to die on that cross, right? And that's something we have to understand. You know, a lot of people in jail give their life to Christ, but they're still in jail. So sin has consequences. And not only does it affect us, it affects others around us. And that was something that I was, I was starting to realize that my actions were having a ripple effect on other people, having a ripple effect on relationships I was a part of having a ripple effect on just like different things. And it came to the point where God, you know, gave me a revelation that basketball was becoming idol worship because idol worship was anything we put before God and basketball was definitely being put before God. So I had that revelation and I didn't want to start this ministry. I didn't want to do youth and fellowship. I didn't want to be what I was doing. I just wanted to be a basketball player, but I was the preacher, right? Like I was going to, we're just going to follow him and support him, but I didn't think God would propel me to do what I'm doing now. But as we all see through COVID, um, basketball um, was stripped for me. And I realized how much I loved it because I just grew, I fell into a, a deep depressive state um, and realizing finally that, you know what, I needed, to, I needed to make a change. You know, I wasn't eating, I wasn't training, just in a bad place. And I realized, you know, like the Bible says, I can do, Philippines 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And the Bible says that seek ye first the kingdom of God and all things shall be added unto you. And the hard part about Christians is we're not seeking the kingdom of God. We're, we're, we're trying to get the second part. We're trying to get the part where it says all things will be added unto you. But the Bible promises and the Bible is telling us that if we seek the kingdom, 
that yes. God will give us what our hearts desires. Because the Bible says, I will bless you according to the desires of your hearts. Right. Yeah. And for me, it was difficult because I was used to getting what I wanted. I was used to getting the fame. I was used to getting all these different things. But these things were taken away from me. So I had a bit of, a, of an identity crisis. Right. And through that identity crisis, I found God uh, this summer. Through the identity crisis, I found, you know, my salvation because I was living off of borrowed faith. And for the viewers, I don't know what that means. Borrowed faith is simply, you know, I believe that I was a Christian because of my parents. But that's not true. Right. You got to have a personal relationship with Jesus to consider yourself a Christian. And that's something yeah. I didn't have. And that's something I was working on this summer that I grew into. And now for me, even I'm sitting here, I'm still waiting for a basketball contract, but I'm so much more content. I'm so much more focused on what God can do for me and on what I can do for God and what not what God can do for me. Because not everything I do now is a kingdom mindset. I'm always kingdom driven. Does this give glory to God? Right. So for me, taking away basketball and God propelling me, propelling me into the actual calling that he's called me into, because at the end of the day, the ball is going to stop dribbling. Basketball is going to stop one day. Now, that question I ask myself is, what do I know, what, what, what do I want to remember it as as a basketball player or someone that gave glory to God and someone that helped save souls? You know, and I always tell people this basketball is what I do. It's not who I am now. Right. It's just what I do. It's my occupation. It's my job. So what I am is a professional athlete for Christ, a servant of Christ, and that's something I'm 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 proud of. Oh, man. Well, as you all can see, Meshach is actually quite passionate about his faith. It's pouring out of him as he's speaking, you know. So that's that's how you know it's 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 a near and dear to his heart. Uh, just kind of talking on the whole borrowed faith concept that he mentions, it's interesting because I, another way I've heard that said is God doesn't have any grandchildren. You know, he only has sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. He only has ones who, uh, who who directly choose to make him their father, right? right? He said that when he has believed and received him, to those ones he gave the right to call him children of God or to be called children of God. Right. right? So we, we got to go to Jesus for ourselves. We have to come to the Father for ourselves. Like there is no grandfathering in the kingdom. There's only you know making God your father, the, actually the the father and the Lord of your life, right? and from there that's when all things start to flow. You know. Right. So yeah. To God be the glory for that. And that's awesome. Amen. So yeah, I, I, you kind of already, you know, destroyed the second question already because it was, if basketball had been an idol to you, 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 you touched on that and how the COVID season has kind of helped shift you through that, you know, so, uh, you know, to God be the glory for that. So that being said, so now, in, in, in keeping with what you were talking about, though, how basketball is no longer, is now what you do and no longer who you are, who you are is now a, a servant and a, a son of the Most High God and you want to be living out that life for him. So, that means that, practically speaking, um, what do you think will be different about bas about you playing basketball now? Should you uh, return to doing that when you know things open up again? You know, whether locally or abroad, like, what will actually be different? Like, how will you go about it differently? What do you plan to do maybe uh, this time around that you weren't doing before uh, this whole season happened? The biggest change for me, I think. Um... You know, the Bible says, do not worry about tomorrow, for today has troubles of its own. I was so consumed and so focused on what tomorrow or the next day would bring, not realizing that the day that I'm living today, right? The Bible says this is the, the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it, right? So, like, you know, having blessings of today and having things that were a blessing to me, you know, uh, neglecting those things and focusing on, okay, what am I going to do tomorrow or the game tomorrow instead of enjoying being in the moment? I think for me, going back to basketball now, my mindset is just to be in the moment and just be present, right? Every day, be present. You know, build like you know, like 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 it's like building a house. When you're building a house uh, on a foundation, you know, they say God is you know the rock of the it's our rock foundation, right? Understanding that it takes time to build that house. It's a process. You got to go through a molding phase. You got to go through a lot of phases. You got to break down the bricks, like a lot of things to get that house to be strong and stable. And that was the thing for me. I was rushing the steps, right? It's like having that house, the Bible talks about illustration versus the rock versus the sand, right? I, my foundation was on that sand. And if you understand sand, if, if water comes against sand, it's easily drawn away, right? And that was the thing with me. I was easily manipulated. I was easily tempted, you know? And for me, um, you know, just being present and understanding that it, it's just a game. And I know a lot of people say it's more than a game. To some people, it absolutely is. You know, if you can make millions of dollars off it and profit off it, for sure. It is definitely more in the game because the impacts basketball has. But I'm just talking about the sense of 
winning or losing determined how my days went. And I, and I can no longer allow that to happen to me, you know? Now I get joy, because the Bible says when one soul is saved, the angels rejoice. I get joy from seeing someone get baptized. You know, we baptized someone last week, Shane, um, and I, I got joy from that, right? That same joy you used to get from me sinking a three-pointer or, or getting a dunk, I still get the same joy and pleasure from that, but it's not a make or break uh, situation for me anymore. For me, it's just about understanding who I am, um, what I do, why I'm, why I'm playing basketball, and the main purpose of it is to give glory to the kingdom, right? At the end of the day, because through basketball, basketball, basketball is only a, a higher platform for me to spread the gospel. That's all it is. It gives me more an advantage. I can touch and re reach more people, right, if I didn't have this platform. And that's what God is doing. I believe God is now going into places like Hollywood. He's going into places like uh, professional athletes, and he's getting them to proclaim the name of Jesus because, you know, God is not happy with, 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 with a lot of our church our church members because what is happening is Christianity has almost become like a fraternity club, fraternity, you know, we're like, we're keeping things to ourselves. You know, the Bible says what? Go ye into the world and preach the gospel. And a lot of us are refusing to do that. We're just, you know, I don't know what my friends would think about us. I don't, I don't want to be judged, right? But the Bible says, if you're ashamed of me before your friends, I will be ashamed of you before my father. So we have to understand that at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's about souls. Right. If you if you if your friend was stuck in a burning house or a burning car, would you not save him? Or if you saw trouble ahead from your friend, would you not tell him the truth? Right. The Bible says the truth will set you free. I think a lot of us were more worried about the reaction we'll get rather than the Holy Spirit doing the work. Right. It's like watering a plant. You don't know how that plant's going to bloom sometimes. but You got to water it daily. You got to water it and water it. Right. And the watering is the Holy Spirit. What we do is we plant the seed. All we do is plant the seed. You might give some love here and there and give some little trickles of water, but ultimately the Holy Spirit does the job because as humans, we cannot change the heart of man. Only God can change the heart of man. And I've been seeing it happen and happen and happen over time during COVID, a time where you would think um, people would struggle. What I saw was, was Christians struggling, but I saw a lot of the world coming to Christ. I saw a lot of the world coming to Christ, and that's something that I've taken note of. And for me, understanding when I get back to playing, it's just going to be, you know, win a game, lose a game. It's giving God the glory. You know, if I win a game and I play well, the first thing I want to say is, you know, I thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you know, for who I am and for what I'm doing, because without him, none of this would be possible. And that's going to be the biggest difference for me is, is not being ashamed as I was before. Yeah. And not having your identity wrapped in what you were doing as before. Because before it was all about basketball. Like you, like you said, if the game went well, you're probably the top of the world. And if, if the game didn't go well, you're probably starting to end the world. You know, so no longer is your identity going to be wrapped in what you do. But it's going to be more of a platform and a vehicle for you to convey who you are. Right. And what's the fact that you're going to put the gospel in the kingdom, right? Right. So, amen. You know, yeah, and that's, and that's awesome to hear. Not to Amen. Like amen. So uh, I guess uh, shifting gears a little bit, man, uh, I, I want to talk about the other side of it because, you know, in, in our flyer, we were advertising, you know, being an athlete for Christ, but also we're talking about reaching our youth, right? And I know that's something that's also very near and dear and a passion in your heart as well. <clears throat> Sorry. So that being said, um, what is youth in fellowship? Or well, like, what exactly uh, is that? Then? Uh, I guess uh, how did this start, and what do you feel the purpose for it is? And uh, before he starts as well, for those who are coming, I think I saw my boy Stilo. Uh, keep us posted. And again, let's know how the audio is. If there's any problems in hearing either myself or Vishak, let us know, so we can. Uh, Hopefully, correct it as we go along. Like, please do up that favor of keeping us in the know. All right, go ahead, sir. Um, see, part of my transition from you know analyzing basketball to to putting God first was was losing basketball this summer, and I had someone that actually reached out to me and said that they were looking for a, a fellowship because obviously, as you know me, sorry, I'm very open in my preaching on social media, preferably Instagram, and. You know, um, just having that 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 pastoral type of, you I would say anointing to be able to speak and to preach and have wisdom. You know, God given wisdom. Um, and a lot of people. Heart. Mm -hmm. There's a heart, heart, heart as well. As well as you, you have a heart mm -hmm. you know, for, for the flock that God's entrusted you with. Absolutely, and uh, Pastor Kevin actually told me he said it. What he calls it, the terminology is is a gathering anointing, right? Gathering anointing. Gathering is not just, you know, you, you can gather people, but it's also directing people. And that's what I think I'm going to be doing when I go overseas because 
I can't shepherd and mentor those people because I could be in another country, but it's about pointing them to the right direction, which is Jesus, helping them to have a, per helping them to have a stable relationship with Jesus on their own rather than relying. Right. So for me, when I was asked to open youth and fellowship, I started it, it started off really rocky. And the idea behind youth and fellowship is that I really believe that the enemy has been targeting the youth, right? The youth has been the target of the enemy because they're going to be the leaders, the, the, of our, of our, of our future generations. So by desensitizing our children and filling them with, 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 with just nonsense and things that have no benefit to them, um, the enemy is able to control more of society. So for me, I wanted there to be a change because as a youth for myself, I understood what I went through. I understand the things that, you know, are, we, we see just how much like demonic and just nasty things are accessible to even children now just through the internet, right? So for me, it's like, you know what? The Bible says, renew your mind with the word of God. But the, the truth and reality is a lot of people don't read the Bible. They don't read the Bible. So you know what? I told them, I'm going to be the extended version of the Bible through my voice, right? Two people. And when I started Youth and Fellowship, it's funny because when you see the word youth, we probably only have one youth, to be honest. We got a bunch of older people. But it's been beautiful. And it started out really rough, like three or four people. Um, my boy, Anto. Is that what you're saying? Sorry? Are you saying that there's not even a lot of youth in your group or? No, there is some youth, but like not what I envisioned. What I envisioned, I wanted to go after the younger, younger generation. And it has affected the younger generation a lot because I get a lot of messages and stuff. But the people that have been a part of it are people that are ranging from ages, you know, 20, 25, 28, 30 and higher. And a common thing that I'm seeing is a lot of people are depressed. Some people were, were struggling with suicide. Some people were struggling with addiction. A lot of these things, and by the grace of God, you know, God led them to, uh, I guess, my, my ministry. I don't want to see organization. I want to see my ministry. And um, we still. Like you experienced some of the depression thing and not exactly, before, right? exactly. So I can, I can, I can relate for sure. And when I joined it, my my brother uh, Anto, who was one of the admins of the group, he started it with me, and I actually never fully knew Anto. Uh, until this, but the way God connected us was amazing. And, you know, we had other people that helped us, like, you know, like my friend Sharon and, and other people um, that just did a lot for me. And we started out really small in the beginning, like three or a couple, four, four or five of us. And we probably have like close to 50, right? Um, it's been growing. We've expanded through YouTube. We've expanded to uh, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, and it's just what God's doing has just been amazing. And, and the reason why I call it Youth and Fellowship, because it's about bringing people together in fellowship. Sometimes Going to church can be good. Doing this can be good. But it's sometimes bringing real people with real problems in a safe, closed environment to talk about these things and talk about how Jesus can be their deliverer sometimes has a bigger impact, you know, because Jesus was preaching, but he was an evangelist. We think about Jesus was kind of like a street preacher because he was walking down the roads, right? He was walking down the roads, preaching to people. People were following him, right? He wasn't just sitting in, he wasn't confined to a building. Jesus was out there being the word of God. Through his, Jesus through his, through his mouth. The uh, apostle. Mm -hmm. Not the star, but actually the anointing. Because he, he, the, the Bible even calls him the, the apostle of our faith. Mm -hmm. So you look at Jesus' actual anointing. He was able to touch on all of them. Like mm -hmm. two apostles. Like you look at the five uh, four ministry as being a hand. Mm -hmm. uh, the simple analogy that is normally one position kind of relates to all of them. The apostle, they say, tends to be the thumb. Because mm -hmm. that's the apostle. They, they can touch on the prophet. They can touch on... The evangelists they can touch on the on the pastor they can touch on teachers like they are able to touch all realms. So mm -hmm. look at Jesus, he actually was able to touch on all of it, and hence he's the apostle of our faith. Exactly, and, that, and, that, and that's very true. Um, so for me, I'm not saying I'm Jesus. I'm not saying I wanted to be. An, I'm an apostle of the faith, but I kind of wanted to because the Bible so says. Well, yeah. No, for sure. The Bible says Jesus said, "Imitate me, be like me." Right. So when I read that's that scripture, right. I look and I see what did Jesus do? Jesus went. He preached. Jesus didn't come for no good person because no good person by biblical standards existed. But Jesus came for the sinners. He came for the lost. He came for the used and the abused. So he can take their life and, and, and use the glory from it, you know. Um, and, and to God, all the glory, uh, Youth of Fellowship has grown. We've had a lot of people just come out and just be super vulnerable and just see what God is doing and how he's moving. Um, it's just an, it's been amazing. And it's just something that I've continued to help grow and something that I've continued to, you know, push. And we've had people... You know, join us from all over the world. We have people from from Europe, from from India, from Australia, like all over the world that have been tapping in and joining in. And not everyone joins Zoom calls. At the most, we'll have like 16 to 20 people, which is still a lot. 
but we have a lot of people just viewing and just watching our content and answering questions, right? Like, like I said, the Holy Spirit, some people are not ready to fully dive in. So we just want to continue to show them that love and show them that what, what Jesus represented, right? Jesus was, yeah. it was a judge and he had righteous judgment, but Jesus is in his ministry. The first thing he did was show love, you know, yeah. Jesus showed love and care for the people. That's why they were able to follow him first. You know, he didn't come exactly and point the fingers. Doing, exactly. He didn't come and point the fingers and say, you do this, you do that, and you're doing this, you're doing that. No, he showed them love, and then he showed them the way. Right? The Bible says, I am, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? So that was kind of my reasoning why I want to start Youth and Fellowship, why I want to target the youth. And I'm still targeting the youth. A lot of my content information, things we talk about, is, is, is generated towards the youth. But it's also about raising people, you know, older people, to know how to help the generation because I'm doing people a disservice if I'm just preaching to them, not helping them to be, to be, you know, prophets in their own homes, to be apostles in their own homes, to be men of God and women of God within their own families, right? Bringing salvation. We, we, we have a lot of Catholics um, in our group and just like, you know, how they've been praying for their families and the conversion and everything. It's, it's just been amazing what God's doing. Amen. Amen. So awesome. So working with two, uh, have each one reach one kind of thing. And I'm meeting people where they're at also, you know, and I think that's so important. Like, I mean, the woman at, at the at, at the well, you know, mm -hmm. Jesus knew exactly where she was at. He she, he knew all she was caught up in. He, he She knew that she had been with like six men, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, five guys. The sixth one that she was with wasn't her husband. He mm -hmm. knew exactly where, but he showed her love. He showed her compassion. And he, uh, he, 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 he reached her where she was, but he didn't keep her there. He helped mm -hmm. to lift her up to, to become all that she was always meant to be. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that, that's just so key. Like, you know, if, if, we're, if, we're, if, we're, if we're pointing ahead of somebody, it, it, it should not just be to do that. It should be to also help bring them up with us. Now, so much times I think as Christians, we're, we're only more, I'm pointing fingers, but not extending our full hands and be like, hey, come with me and let me show you a man who, who told me everything I ever did. And who I know is, is the hope and the, and, the, and the savior of the world, the Messiah that we've been waiting for. You know, well, and I, you, I think it's so important that we, that we have that balance, even in terms of our witness and, and all that good stuff. Well, you, that, think of, you think of the process too, like um, they, they were going to stone her, they were going to kill her, right? And yeah. in today's society, someone like that would be ridiculed, judged, and shamed. And Jesus told the people, he said, whoever here is without sin cast the first stone. Not a single stone was thrown. Why? Because everyone here knew that they had their own sin. The Bible says that no sin is greater than, greater than any other sin. A lot of us are practicing things like fornication and things behind closed doors, but because someone has a tattoo or is an R&B artist, whatever, we're judging them, right? Judgment starts at the house of God, and that's what Christians have to understand. It's going to start with us, and it's going to start looking for the outward appearance. He's looking for the inward, because the Bible says, with their mouths they praise me, with their hearts they are far from me right you can preach sing songs do whatever you want but if your heart is not right it doesn't matter and jesus showed that was a prostitute right jesus was even washing people's feet right when the bible says to imitate me be like me walk like jesus we have to actually read the gospels and understand what jesus actually did to understand what it means to walk with and like jesus <clears throat> yeah i was so keen about that story i'm not sure if you touched on this but i, I think your screen froze for a minute as you were talking but what's so key there's a, there's a key line that you could pull the accusers of that story with the woman who was caught in the act of uh, adultery, which was that he who is without sin cast the first stone. Mm -hmm. you know, so she wants to throw stones at people and you know point out their flaws and point out this and point out that. But if you're without sin, then you should be the first one to cast a stone. The reality is no one is without sin. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And it's only by the grace of God that we can stand where we are right now. You know, right. as, as sinners who've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So it's, it's a good message as, as well that, yeah, we have to remember that if, if we're, we're without sin, we should cast stones. But if we still have our own stuff we're working on, let's be gracious to other people, just like how we enjoy God being gracious to us. Right. Because we need the benefits of the of his grace and his mercy. We ought to be the ones who expect that to others. And I remember mm -hmm. that when he was talking, you know, and it's, it's so funny how religion always wants to oppress women, you know, to like, to, to, to pull them down, to, to, to call them the harlot, to call them all these different stuff. Like, Jesus is the one that looks good enough as well. You know what I mean? And, and it shouldn't not be the case for this church also, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, man. So, yeah, so after, after we're very close, but after the great discussion, uh, so the last question I, I, that uh, I want to uh, pose, at least for now, unless I mean, another one comes up, is uh, so a lot of all of this, a lot of your whole you know, story, your journey, 
uh, your history with God, especially this year and how this year has been a monumental year and shifted you uh, to the place that you felt God always called you to be. Mm -hmm. So now that you are where you, where you stand, what would your advice be to a young, aspiring Christian athlete, you know, looking to rep Christ, whether it's in the field of basketball or you know, another field of, of, of uh, professional sports, maybe football, soccer, whatever it is, what would your advice be to a young, aspiring athlete uh, who wants to rep Christ uh, to, to do that, but also to avoid some of the pitfalls that you went through uh, arriving where you are now? I would just say three words. Accountability, transparency, transparency, and commitment. Accountability is important. You got to have people in your corner that can hold you accountable. Maybe that's your wife. Maybe that's your pastor. Maybe that's your friend. Because, you know, a lot of people, even in the church, men, we struggle with a lot of addictions that we struggle with. And not having that accountability and not having that vulnerability to, to reach out and speak you know, we went to um, uh, an all men's encounter and you just saw how much different people were struggling with many different things and just the release of pressure they felt just by having someone to talk to. And we didn't even know all each other too tough out there, right? It was just having a brother, but we're all bound by the blood of Jesus at the end of the day, right? Yeah. Um, and accountability is important. And I'm lucky and blessed to have a father as a pastor and my mom who's an intercessor who, you know, I'm able to go to them for things and they can, they can, you know, they can rebuke me or, and, and tell me the truth and help me. And that's what you need. You need people in your life that can tell you the truth. Not people that can lie to you and tell you whatever. That will help you not only be successful in your faith, it will help you be successful in your career. No sugar coating yeah. or ear tickling, right? And yeah. commitment is to be committed. what you want to hear, that I kind of tickle your ears all the time, mm -hmm. right? And, right. Com and commitment is my second point. Commitment, I say this, why? Because it's important to be committed, right? When you give ourselves to Christ, right? We got to be committed. And it's not just about only declaring, you know, I, I give myself, you know, I declare myself as a servant of Christ and I, f I follow Jesus and make that commitment. We could also be committed to following steps that help us stay on that narrow road, right? Maybe it's joining a Bible study. Maybe it's praying. It's, maybe it's reading your word, right? The Bible says, what, what did God say to Joshua? He says, meditate my word day and night and do as I said to my servant Moses, Right? When Moses died and Joshua took over, this is what God had told Joshua, right? Because Joshua wanted to be a good leader. So understanding that the word of God is the stable foundation of everything that is what we believe in, because that's where it first started, right? And we have to understand the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So when we talk about fear, if the president of the United States or the prime minister were to walk in our house, we'd clean up the place, we'd be super anxious, whatever. But we understand that the Bible says God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. So he sees everything, right? So we don't always keep ourselves clean before God because we don't physically see him. But the Bible says, blessed are those who believe without seeing, right? The Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, right? A lot of us, we don't open our Bible and read. So it's very easy for us to fall into false doctrine. It's very easy for us to to follow prophetic words or, or follow different things without having a foundation of the word of God, right? Even Jesus was tempted. And we have to understand when Jesus was tempted, what did Jesus do? He said, you should not tempt the Lord your God. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus used the word of God. Now we've seen the Bible to defeat Satan. He used the word of God. So commitment is important um, to be committed to your faith, meaning you have to align, you have to align yourself and, and engage in things of Christ that can keep you strong. Right? Because the Bible says that the flesh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yeah. Right? No one here can say, like, I'm a Christian, I'm strong, I don't need to do anything else, read the Bible, I'll be good. It's impossible. It's impossible. Because if the devil's brave enough to even tempt the Son of God, imagine us as humans. Right? Yeah. Many great men of God fell. Many great men of God. The Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. Even David himself fell. He fell to lust and temptation through Bathsheba. Right? And so commitments, is, it's, it's, it's one of the biggest things that I see. In, and, you know, same way we get up in the morning, we put up shots, we go to the weight room, we're working on our body. How about your spirit? How much spiritual exercise are you giving yourself? The word of God, that's the food. That's the food yeah. for the soul, food for the spirit. You know, people want to talk about soul food and, you know, the fried chicken and stuff, you know, mom be making on Thanksgiving and stuff. How about that soul food for your, for your spirit? How about that soul food to strengthen your faith, right? A lot of people, the Bible says that the, near the, uh, in the end times of faith of many will grow cold, and we're seeing that. 
And the reason why people's faith is growing cold is because people don't have a biblical foundation, foundation of sound doctrine, right? Well, they don't understand what the word is saying. They're saying, Lord, why am I going to do this? Why am I going to do this? The Bible literally says, there's a scripture where it says that, do not worry because there are brothers and sisters around the world going through the same thing we are going through. But a lot of people don't say that, see that. And Jesus promised us persecution. He promised us things we're going to go through. It doesn't mean that Jesus is the one causing it. He knows the enemies there because the Bible says what? The enemy roams like a roaring lion looking for whom to devour. See, the enemy is always there and he's been there seeking since the beginning of time. Seeking, seeking who he may devour, right? So he's and not he's, just devour anybody. He's only who he may. Those who exactly. Have to space of provision for exactly. him to devour them. Right. Exactly. And the Bible says that sin separates us from God. So what sin does is sin creates an open door, legality for, for the enemy to have legal rights. What did the enemy do with Job? The enemy couldn't touch Job. He had to accuse Job to God before he could even attack, he could even attack Job. And it's something we have to understand. Being committed is important because I always tell people this. When you're not a Christian, you're basically a walking dead man, to be honest. You're not following Christ. You're just going through the motions. And you're not fighting any real battle, to be honest. Right, because yeah, the enemy, exactly. But once you step on to that Christian, once you become a child of God, the battle starts. Right, yeah. but the Bible says that the battle is your His, but the victory belongs to us. Amen. Right, the victory belongs to us, and God has already given us the victory. And I think a lot of Christians, we have to learn to fight from a position of victory. No longer can Come we on. fight from from a position where we're sitting there and you know we're, we're living in fear and God do this, God do that. No, we gotta start decreeing. We gotta start declaring. We gotta start speaking with our mouths open. We gotta start speaking that the devil's a liar, knowing that his end is near. And when the devil reminds you of your past, we gotta start reminding the enemy of his future. That's and this it. is something that a lot of us are not, are, are, not able, are not able to do, right? If you are fighting from a place of weakness, how can you ever win, right? The Bible says, if God is for us, who can stand against us, right? Yeah. Greater is he that is in me than the one who's in the world, right? Yeah. We got to learn to profess these things and to speak in authority. And the enemy respects authority. He responds to authority. Demons respond to authority. Yeah. When Jesus cast it out of the demons, out of, out of the legion, you know, out of the demon, right? He spoke with authority. He didn't sit there and talk and say whatever. He spoke with authority. When the disciples were casting out demons, they spoke with authority. The, the enemy has taken away authority from Christians. Yeah. He's taken away our authoritative power and made us well, powerless. I, I he, he, he's robbed us of our understanding of the right. authority that we have. Right. Absolutely. People Absolutely. are perishing for the lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's what it talks about, right? Absolutely. My, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Exactly. And we got to understand that we're, 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 we're fighting about it on two fronts. When I say two fronts, we're not only fighting the powers of darkness, we're also fighting the world, right? The flesh, yeah. the temptation, right? And the only way you're able to overcome this stuff is by renewing your word, the word of re renewing your mind with the word of God. And that's by getting into the Bible. So these are the biggest things I would tell an athlete or not just in basketball, any sport. And the last thing I want to say is be yourself. Don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to be like, okay, I got to be super holy because you'll never be super holy. You're going to sin. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to fall. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So be yourself. Understand that you're going to make mistakes, but be quick to repentance. Why did God love David so much? If you read the book of Psalms, many of it is David's weeps and cries towards God. David sinned, but he was quick to repentance, right? If you are a believer or a Christian and you sin and you go into habitually sinning, meaning you no longer feel any conviction, that is when you should be worried. But if you still have that conviction to repent and want to ask forgiveness, the evidence of salvation is still within your mind. That knowledge of salvation is still there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and that's my biggest advice, you know, because, again, I wasn't committed. I was never myself, right? And I never had any accountability. And all three of those things not having them made me fall. But now having all of those three things now moving forward, I feel as stronger as I never, right? Greater is he that is in me than is one that's in the world. The enemy can bring whatever. He can bring temptation. He can bring pain. He can bring suffering, right, into your life, right? But none shall work. You know, the Bible says we, know, we should not fear um, the terror by day or the arrow that flies by night, right? Yeah. And God yeah. is telling us that we have to learn to fight from a place of authority. We have to learn to put our trust in him. We have to learn to put our trust in him, right? God wants us to trust him, and that's something we got to do. That's, and it's easier, it's, it's easier said than done. But yep. it's something that you'll look back on your life and you'll see, wow. We look at the story of Joseph. Joseph was sold by his brothers, right? Part of his wife. You look, you look at the story of Joseph and Samson. You know, we talk about lust. Two people that God used, Samson even more, because Samson was used, you know, as a weapon, a physical weapon. 
right? Yeah. Both different endings. Why? Samson fell to the to Delilah in temptation, and what was his judgment? He died. But in his last breath, God gave him a strength to kill the enemies around him. Joseph, the Bible said, fled from part of his wife, and in his obedience, in his righteousness, standing firm, even though he was thrown in jail, he ended up because of his ability to interpret dreams. He became the governor of Egypt to the point that his brothers, even the same brothers that sold him, stood before him and wept, asking for forgiveness. Right? God can raise a person like David as a shepherd to become the king of Israel. Right? But God is asking us. David had the faith to be able to go and approach Goliath. So I want to tell everyone that's live, all of the Goliaths that are in front of our lives, how are you approaching them? Are you approaching them like a David, right? Are you approaching them like a Saul, right? When Saul, the reason why Saul lost his kingdom, right? Because Saul was not listening to the prophets. He was not listening to what God was telling him. And the Bible says that the prophet told Saul, your kingdom will be handed over to David, right? And even when Saul sinned, God didn't take away because the Bible says that the gifts that God gives us are without repentance, God didn't take it away. God said, I regret the day I made Saul king. He said, I regret the day I made Saul king. He didn't say, Saul, I'm going to take away. I'm going to, I'm going to kill you, take away your kingdom. But in the end, because of Saul's disobedience, which was actually him summoning a, a necromancer to get a word, right, to revive the dead prophet. And that was the first time in the Bible that God actually allowed, other than Lazarus, someone to come back because the prophet actually spoke. And he said, Saul, why are you disturbing my sleep, right? And gave him the word of God, telling him that tomorrow him and his sons will be dead. As we see, they both died, and the kingdom was given over to David. David was a shepherd. Many of us are sheep. Many of us are just walking through the motions. Many of us are people who we don't think we're big, right? And we're facing a lot of Goliaths in our lives. But like all the Goliaths, we got to start approaching them and facing them in the same way that David did. And David did it with a slingshot and a rock. He had no armor. He had no shield. But his greatest weapon was coming in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Lord. Amen. Which is a strong tower. The righteous can run into it and we are safe. Amen. Right? Um, Amen. Yeah, no, no great points. Um, what's interesting, just, just a few things to, to tack on. Uh, with, with the whole Saul and David point, it's interesting. Like, like Saul was always about getting the approval and the affirmation of the people. And looking through his life, that was always kind of his his trajectory and his focus and stuff, right? And um, I mean, I think uh, calling back Samuel, I mean, people have different thoughts. There are thoughts that he could have been revived. Some people say that it might have been a familiar spirit of Samuel that, that he also spoke to and stuff. And what's interesting is uh, Saul was never actually God's original choice. As well, like, like uh, basically God gave into the pride of the people. The people wanted the king so they could be like every other nation. But mm -hmm. God said, you know what, like, the, uh, the, so what Samuel felt distraught about that, he said, you know what, Samuel, don't worry about it. They haven't rejected you. They rejected me as mm -hmm. their king. You know, like God's choice ultimately was always David, like his hand was on David. So the, when, when we gave it to the people's choice, we saw what the fruit of that was, chaos, disorder, you know, him, him, or whatever else. When the, God's choice was, was actually brought forth in David, you saw that although David wasn't perfect and he fell at different times, you know, like the hand of God was with David because that was the, 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 the vessel that, that God has, had, has set aside for his purposes. And ultimately, mm -hmm. throughout the, 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 you know, the lineage of the Bible, Ultimately, you know, Christ comes out of the line of David, and we know that he's a true Messiah and the rec reconciliation of Israel. So Amen. ultimately, God does become their king again. It just came about in a, in a way that, you know, we wouldn't have expected. Like, you know, we, we thought, okay, well, God himself, but no, God became the king again. It just happened in a way that we wouldn't have thought. Amen. You know what I mean? Amen. Also, just thinking about the whole, I, I know we talk about the, the weakness thing and how, how we, you know, in our ways, we, we have to learn how to reach out to God. You know, the interesting thing with that as well is even if we feel weak, the Bible says, let the weak say that I am strong, <laughs> and let Amen. the poor say that I am rich. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. So we have to learn how to speak those things, even if we don't feel it, even if we, in ourselves, even if we don't see it, even if it doesn't seem like it's happening around us, even if, if we feel that we don't have it. But the Bible says we have to learn to speak those things that mm -hmm. be not as though they are, you know, because life and death, it's in the power, power of the tongue. Power. Yep. You know, so you need to encourage you know, any future athletes out there, and even in whatever field you're, you're, you're endeavoring, like learn to lean into the strength of the Lord. You might not always feel strong in yourself. You might not always feel like you have it together or you have what it takes, but it was never about you to begin with. <laughs> if, mm. if you could do it all yourself, then Jesus would never have to come and die on the cross and, and, and be the, the, the mediator between us and God. Amen. The reality is we don't have it in ourselves. That's why we have a, a, a great savior that we're able to reach out. And the cross 
is that place of exchange. Mm -hmm. the, the, the cross is that place where we can lay down our weakness and get his strength. You know, where right. we can lay down our poverty and receive his riches. Where we can give him our sin and receive his grace and his mercy. Like the cross is the medium. So if nothing else, we don't want to encourage you guys, just look to Jesus. You know, like, you know, he's, he's the anchor that never fails. He's the anchor that always holds. And, and, you know, and, and yes, have the accountability because it's important. The Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You know, um, so have those great sounding boards in your life that will tell you the truth, as Misha talked about, not just what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. Because sometimes mm -hmm. we need to hear certain things that we don't always, that are not always pleasant to our flesh. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, look to Jesus. You know, because like he's, he's, he's our anchor, he's our strength, and he is the vine. Right? And if we abide in him, and his word abides in us, that's, that's the only place that we can start to bear much truth. From apart from him, we can do nothing. Amen. You know? So just understand, like, this, this walk of faith is not always a feeling. You know, faith mm -hmm. is not feeling. Faith is a decision. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no matter what comes against me, no matter what's going on, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to God's unchanging hands, and I'm going to believe in his goodness. I'm going to believe in his grace. Because that's how you see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Mm -hmm. Simply not letting go of him. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you saw at the beginning of this life, we had a whole bunch of technical difficulties since we're not running too smooth. I'll, I'll be honest, in my flesh, I kind of wanted to like, give up and like, ah, forget this again, you know? Like, but, but I knew, you know what? I, 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 I made a commitment that we were going to do this. Now, a lot, I know a lot of people are going to be encouraged by this message, so we press on. No, I mean, sometimes we, we have to press through until we break through. Amen. You know, we, we have to learn how to press it, but the Bible says we can't be weary of doing good. You know, because in due season, you know, we reap a harvest of, mm -hmm. his, of his blessings, of his mercy, of his good. Like, the harvest will come if we faint not. You know, so like, Amen. don't always think you have to feel it in order to be it. You know what I mean? Like, the Bible says, let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. You know, like, you can speak those things that be not in, in, that you feel, uh, in, in yourself as though they are. And, and God will honor that confession. Because guess what? He is the high priest over our confession. Amen. So mm -hmm. if, if we're not confessing his word, there's actually nothing for him to preside over. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like the Bible says he watches over his word to perform it. So I appreciate yeah. that like, when, when trials come, like, what's the first thing that comes out of your mouth? Are you speaking how you feel? Or are you speaking what his word says? Mm -hmm. You know, the power in the words that even shift you, but we have to make sure that we keep our eyes upon the word. And we know that, that, that ultimately the word is Christ. You know, he, mm -hmm. he was the word. He became flesh and he dwelt among us. Amen. amen. And the last thing I want to say, the Bible says that the promises of God are yes and amen. amen. Right? The Israelites, when they were delivered from the, from the hands of Pharaoh, God promised them uh, the promised land. Why were they delayed? Because of sin, because of disobedience. So although God can promise you, although God can give you something, your sin is what can cause delay in our lives. So God is, yeah. God is telling us going into the new year, don't go back to Egypt, right? Move forward into Jerusalem and don't look back, right? And don't wait till January 1st or December 31st to make a change. Start making a change now. Start following Jesus Amen. now. Start working on your diet now. Start making those decisions and choices you want to do that you said you would. Do them now. So when the new year comes, you'll be ready to go. You'll be yeah. ready to go and you'll walk into your purpose into the new year. Yes. Because uh, uh, obedience is ultimately what God wants out of his servants, out of his sons and his daughters. Like any, any father tends to have a heart that's, a, that's inclined towards the obedience. Like you want your, your children to obey you. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like you're, you and your brother seem to be a good example of that. You seem like you're very obedient. Like any, any father takes the light in children who are obedient to him. Amen. Yeah, and the Lord's the same way. Like he's, he's a perfect father. He, he, he looks for our obedience. In fact, the Bible says that obedience to God is better than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. you know, we give up all these things that we think God wants, but if we're not actually obeying what God tells us to do, when he tells us to do it, you know, like that's, that, 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 that's what he's looking for. He's looking for an obedient heart. But he's looking for a, a yielded and submitted life. Amen. So I encourage you, yeah, I, I encourage you, let, let 2021 be a year of deeper obedience. We allow the Lord to take you to that place of, of just surrender and, and submission. You know, and, and, and that you allow him to, to, to mold his image upon your heart. Because it, it, he desires obedience even above sacrifice. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. So, Mr. Sure, Meshach, can you actually close us off in the quick word of prayer, sir? As we Absolutely. Are, I don't see any questions here. So, I, I think we're, we're more or less good to close it Absolutely. off. Absolutely. <clears throat>
Father, we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy, Lord. We thank you for this wonderful day you've given us, Lord. The Bible declares, Lord, this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it, Lord. The word also says, Lord, that where there are two or three gathered in your name, you're there within the midst. Father, this is a gathering, Lord God. Even though, Lord God, we did not come together in prayer, Lord God, we came here to share an open testimony of the goodness of your grace and mercy. Thank you for Brian, Lord God, for what he's doing, shedding your word, uh, allowing this platform to be used, Lord God, to, to be a source of encouragement, especially in a time that we're living in a pandemic. Father, I pray, Lord God, you will reward him, Lord God, in Jesus' name, and that you continue to use him for your glory, Lord God, in Jesus' name. The Bible declares, Lord God, that we should not boast in our strength, but boast in our weakness, because knowing, Lord God, that you are a provider, Lord God. You are Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Elohim. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We pray for everyone that is watching this, that they will be touched by the blood of Jesus. Father, that they will be encouraged. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit will even convict those, Lord God, that are struggling with addiction and temptations, Father. I pray, Lord God, in Jesus' name, for your people, Lord God, to be called. For the Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, Father, you will heal their land. And I just pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Father, for this platform, we thank you for your people. We pray for this earth, Lord. We destroy every every oracle, Lord God. We destroy every demonic altar that has been risen against your people. We cancel it and we destroy it by the reason of the blood of Jesus, Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name, Father, for your blessings. We pray for obedience. We pray for discipline. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, praise the Lord. And, and remember, delayed obedience is also disobedience. That's mm -hmm. what that came to my heart today. So when the, when the Lord speaks to you, do your best to do it properly. I know sometimes we have all our tendency to like do and not, but delayed obedience is also disobedience. Amen. So even one that falls into that category, purpose in your heart that this year it will be a year that you will get rid of that. That when, mm -hmm. the, when the Lord speaks to you, that your heart will say, "Here I am, send me." Type of thing. Like you have that heart of of of, uh, of Isaiah and Daniel, just that that, that is quickly. And prompt to obey what the Lord tells you to do. Because Amen. Obedience is, is disobedience. Amen. Amen. So, uh, yeah, so God bless folks. Thanks for making it uh, hanging out with us, making it this far. Those who have, we hope you've been encouraged and edified by the different truths and nuggets that have been dropped here. And we give God all the glory. Uh, Amen. So, I'm, I'm Anna Dr. Actually, uh, Mr. Meshach, is there any uh, people want to get a hold of you to learn more about your ministry? What are the different channels and uh, ways that they could do that? Uh, you can find us at Youth in Fellowship on Instagram, uh, also on Facebook. You can find us there. You can also find us on YouTube. We have all of our content there. And if you're interested in joining a live or a Bible study, you can find us on Instagram or Facebook as well, and we can get you connected. Amen. Cool. And that, that would be it. That's, that's, that's pretty much it. That's it. Yes, sir. Okay, cool. And as you all know, you can always look, look me up with Live of Lee Wars, Live and Happy. We, we do it every other, uh, on a weekly basis, we're coming out to you. Give me that fresh, inspiring, uplifting content. I pretty much you can find me, find it under my name, Brian Lee Wars, either here on Facebook or on Instagram. I'm on mm -hmm. both. So my Instagram handle is actually I am Lee Wars B specifically. I also have a new Facebook page I just started and it's been doing pretty well. You also look up under to find more encouraging, uplifting, edifying content. Uh, announcements about different lives as well. They're always happening there. Uh, so that's pretty much it. If you also would like to be a, a, a next guest on a future Live of Lee Wars, hit me up. We're always open and, and uh, we're ready to hear what people have to say. So by all means, I'd love to have you. And just DM me and we can uh, set it up. I'm, we're pretty good for the rest of the month and probably even next month. But hit me up and we can always see what's possible. Um, next live will actually not be Friday because it's going to be Christmas. Can you believe me? We're already at Christmas, Time, Shack. It's only time, a, a, a week away, man. Time's flying, man. Yeah, Time's flying. I'm thinking of, of doing a, 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 the next live around uh, the 23rd on the Wednesday, because uh, I think there's a good word in this season that could be uh, encouraging the folks. So just look out for that. I'll have another guest that will actually speak to the, the current season. I think it will be a, a, an informative um, live for many people as well. So just look out for that next Wednesday. I'm hoping to drop another live that will speak to our current situation. Uh, mm -hmm. But until then, yeah, I guess this is uh, Brian Lee works out. Uh, along my, my, my special guest is Mr. Vishak Lufio. And yeah, until next time, God bless. I remember Jesus is Lord. Amen. All right, folks. Thank you for having time. me. No problem, man. It's my pleasure. Take care. All right. You can, you can, you can log off now. Just, I'll see if I can close it. All right. Thanks for coming through, folks. All the best. God bless you. Check my page for future announcements, as I said. All the best.